TNTM the show presents me Zach Howard how's <laughs> everyone doing I'm the host Paulo Gunner and and we're I'm here to interview you for your Kickstarter campaign book yes sir Moonshine Bigfoot yes yes thank you for having me I'm excited to be here and uh ready to blather about everything for you from whatever you need my career books I've done and of course uh, my Kickstarter, I'm very excited about. So, first of all, where where can we find it? Go to Kickstarter. It's live right now. We fund it in 11 hours. Uh, we're very fortunate in that. However, we still need a little more cash so we can actually produce this and pay our mortgages. On Kickstarter, just look look up Moonshine Bigfoot, or you can go to the actual link, and that is www.inked.pub slash Moonshine Bigfoot. Last one, oh, one word. It's under projects we love also. Hit any of my socials or any of my uh, uh, crew socials and uh, we'll be abusing you with links as well. So you're the comic book artist for this four-part series book, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yeah, It's uh, an image series. Image picked it up right away, which we're pretty proud of when it was just in the concept phase. And now we're scrambling to uh, get it. Uh, well, we're not scrambling. We're going to spend this year uh, producing it. And then we're going to publish it in February, just get on the other side of the holiday season. We didn't want to launch during Thanksgiving week, which was our other option from Image. Uh, so we're going to do February. I'm the uh, co-creator, whatever co-writer, whatever uh, credit I end up getting, and uh, the inker. And it's probably better to say I'm a finisher. People know that classical phrase uh, from old school comic books. So this is the first time I've done a book where I'm inking somebody else uh hell probably since justice league back in the aughts when i inked carlo barbary i think if i remember correctly so it, it's really exciting for me but i'm working with steve ellis of uh lobo fame he's also uh, has some of the most famous magic the gathering card paintings he's a phenomenal painter and he was looking to get back on tour in south africa last year on this crazy trip we both had and we became pretty good friends and he was looking to get back in comics so when we developed, uh, me and my writer friend developed the initial idea for Moonshine Bigfoot, which was came out of us just joking around and bitching about uh, Hollywood and remakes of Dukes of Hazard and stuff, I thought of Steve because he's he's this classical cartoonist where I'm a very hyper, as you can see my crap, I'm hyper rendered and structured and where he ha always is about elasticity. He has that traditional animation feel to it. So we kind of developed a style together, uh, and it's just turning out brilliantly. And I, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, I'm working on uh, the next cover right now over his pencils. So it's it's really exciting. It's a new venture for me. I haven't done a comedy since Sean Murphy and I did Outer Orbit for Dark Horse in 2005. Just beyond, I haven't had this much fun making a comic book in a very long time so uh very excited that's awesome that's good to hear i was gonna say like i saw the art and i was like you know i i read the idea and i was like uh, this this sounds pretty out there and then i saw the art and i was like i'm sold like this looks awesome awesome then, thanks man and on top of that just like you said like dukes of hazard i was like this is like dukes of hazard but with sasquatch well, that's how we came up with the idea. I was bitching about Hollywood remakes just trying to retread a tire because they're kind of cowardly. They just they they desperately want to tap into fan bases that are already there. Right. So I was I was just joking around. I was like, if you're gonna make Dukes of Hazard seven, why don't you do something fun and have Bigfoot driving it or something? <laughs> and that that's it. Just we built a world around that over like a six month period and it became this surrealist kind of love affair with uh kind of 1980 about that time period the the americana the pop culture of that time of uh, american pop culture so we had the first wave of asian influences like speed racer and all those goofy shows g-force just mm -hmm. wildly different than what we do versus say dukes of hazard uh or knight rider or a team or uh, there's about a 10 year span between about 75 and, and 85 where American cinema, not always just cinema, but especially TV, it was a lot more tongue in cheek and mm -hmm. we didn't take it quite as seriously, uh, though it was very simple conceptually and executed. Uh, they're almost like live action cartoons, say the, the Dukes of Hazard. 
what I miss about it, the more I, I deep dived into the, the nostalgia of that time when I was growing up, there was so much joy and enthusiasm just watching a show and it didn't come with all this political and social weight that almost all entertainment has nowadays. And albeit society is evolving and we need to, we obviously have problems in our society. We need to work out more people, more influences, technology changes, blah, blah, blah. But back then it was really simple and you could get away with things like the Dukes of Hazard because when I was a kid, I absolutely no clue who general lee was in the civil war and what this flag represented you just followed these two hillbillies outwitting doofus cops and it was always fun and they're jumping and that's what i want to capture not that social political and geopolitical struggles aren't relevant within media and and potent it just we seem oversaturated with that to the point where i don't think there's any especially in comic books, I don't see any true comedies anymore. And I don't mean just shtick where Deadpool gets his head ripped off and thrown over a ravine to go save the people on the other side. Uh, that's that's a funny shtick. Uh, but we're trying to make a story out of it. So you become the characters become endearing. So when they are in these comical situations, uh, you have more personally invested in that character and their successes. Um, rather than just being some voyeur and hoping they make you guffaw every once in a while, which I think a lot of storytellers nowadays kind of go the James Gunn route where they just think a one-liner is comedy. You know, that's what she said. That's not really comedy. Uh, it, it's a little witticism where I think if you build joke structures around a story, you have this huge endearing story. And that's what I think Outer Orbit was that we did for Dark Horse uh, back in the day, and there's obviously far more popular ones. Think of Bone by Jeff Smith. Um, not quite the same, uh, built for, for uh, YA or all ages. Um, but you fall in love with the characters. You're not just a voyeur, like whatever happens to them happens to them. So that's what we went about building this. It's a ridiculous world, but what we do is instead of a Bigfoot being ridiculous, we built the whole world to be obscenely cartoonish and wild where Bigfoot's the, the grounding level in it. He's a pessimist. He's basically Scully from X-Files. He's like, I don't know what you mean right there. That's That can't be right. You know, just like, it, so we're, we're having fun turning it a little bit. He has a stable relationship with a wonderful hippie girlfriend. And, uh, all, you know, he's just trying to get the family business going. When his hippie girlfriend, she was blessing her sweaty socks. By the way, she's a she's a foot porn model in the back of magazine. She sells pictures of her feet, um, and she's very proud of that business. She was blessing her sweaty socks in the, the moonlight, dropped a psilocybin mushrooms on Bigfoot's still. Unbeknownst to him, they grew up, grew all around the still and infused with the moonshine. And that's the the kind of the inciting, well, not the inciting incident, but the impetus for how the story moves along is this moonshine becomes a special batch. And it's so potent, a senator drinks it, and it's, a, it's a, like on TV saying ranting crazy stuff and conspiracies and the truth of this and that. Next thing you know, the Illuminati's, or our version of the Illuminati's coming after Bigfoot. And that's basically the story is, he gets sucked into a global conspiracy and he's just trying to deliver some moonshine. Of course, the Illuminati's wild. They're they're too overfunded and too poorly, you know, uh, run by an inept child childlike leader, you know, heir apparent that, that can't quite fit the shoes. And we are black market guy that uh, runs the speakeasy in, in Bigfoot's world and gets all the moonshine for him to distribute. His name's Uncle Pineapple and he's a former... Uh, child uh, or children's show host like, like what am i thinking captain kangaroo-ish type uh thing back this is sorry all young people i'm older in the hills so we're gonna get a lot of 1980 stuff and that type of stuff he's also kind of based on a british children's host too he's a blathering drunk now but his puppet runs the black market which is, it ends up being a lot of fun uh for scenes uh it's just oh my favorite element of just side character that has nothing to do with the story we even have Ronald Reagan in it as a, he's an escape. You know what Chuck E. Cheese is? So they have the animatronics that sing the pizza deals. So right. he's an escaped animatronic doll from Chuck E. Cheese that's been repurposed to be president of the United States. So he's just this clunky robot that every once in a while during a speech, 
to the world or or America or whatever, he stops and goes into like a 20 minute pizza deal song of why you should eat pizza. And that goes back to being Ronald Reagan and stuff like that. And that's kind of the flavor of our world. We're not trying to make a grave social point other than the importance of friendship, which is a through, through line through all my books, being loyal to your friends, loyal to your girlfriend, things like that. But other than that, it's not too heavy handed. It's just a lot of fun. But I think we got a kind of lightning in the bottle because I think we built endearing characters that are going to take you on this ridiculous journey, which I think is important and missing in a lot of books to keep the reader from being a voyeur and actually an active participant that you have something of value that you want to see and, and root for so there you go there's my first or second layer of blathering sir awesome yeah it, it looks like a, a blast and it sounds uh like a really fun time too yeah is this four issues this is just going to be like the first the first first part? volume Think or of like the- Hellboy, where it kind of comes out in miniseries, at least what he did for the first 15 years. So it's going to be kind of that format, a, a self-contained miniseries. In fact, we already have, this fortunately has gotten so much attention right now that people are already talking sequel. So we already are planning our, our second miniseries. It's called Canada Ball Run, for those that remember Cannonball Ball Run. So where he's going to be uh, running illegal uh, maple syrup. Uh, <laughs> Across the Canada lines, and each each big story, we're bringing it, bringing in a few other cryptids. And this one, we got a chupacabra and Bigfoot. Those are the two main cryptids. But we have a lot of fun planned, from like drugged out uh, snow yetis to chain smoking uh, mothmen and things like that. That we're going to slowly introduce into this world. That there's other cryptids too. And they're all disasters and have their own interesting personalities. But yeah, this first one is self-contained and it just takes place on the Georgia-Alabama border. Good old boy times uh, where they're jumping creeks and that kind of goofball Southern culture that was more cartoonish and fun back in the day versus than say modern times. Like when I, I, I went to school at Mississippi State and there's a lot of rough stuff going on there as far as social aspects go and, and integration those aren't in our story we're, we're not we're not going to tackle and take people on these journeys of what they should do socially and what was wrong with the past and things like that um, whether the points are valid or not we're just trying to take you on a, a story where you can escape from reality and just laugh while there's an adventure rather than just shtick there's subs- there's there's a meaty humor behind it there's substance in it there's nutrients uh, and we're working very hard to to build that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and like I said, just from what I've read, from what I've seen, it shows. Thanks. And it looks like, like you said, like things were backed fast. Yes, right? we're very and, fortunate. And you had these different levels, because I think it just started off as, as 5,000, right? Yeah, we just wanted to make sure we got enough money to pay our colorist, and that's Steve and I were willing to work for free if we had to, which sucks because then it's just side jobs the whole time. But what we're trying to do now is to get people, we tried to make this Kickstarter so fun that people would back us to where we could work on this full time. We got we got 75 years of, of comic book talent between myself, Steve Ellis, and Nelson Daniel, who has more Eisner nods than any other probably colors not named Dave Stewart. Um, he's my longtime cohort. He's he colored that, he did the cape with me. Anything not named Hellboy, he probably did it with me over the last 13 years. He's just a true masterful painter uh and storyteller. So we got a wizard crew. Accolades, we legacy, we've drawn every single book on planet Earth, uh, including including create our own things. We all have our own successes in that. What we're trying to do now is get enough money to literally pay. The, the five-person crew that we have, a semi-living wage. We're not expecting to get rich, of course. We just want to be able to work and pay our mortgages. And we're well on our way. We're very fortunate that way, and I hope people join us. To that point, we, we're trying to reward people. We know it's hard to take a chance on something. I have my fan base that knows my indie stuff and a, a few main titles. Steve Ellis has his old Lobo fans, then a, a mountain of... Magic the Gathering fans, Nelson Daniel, just profound storyteller. He's worked on every magical thing on Earth that uh, either I've done or or uh, Gabe Rodriguez and people like that. He, he's just a brilliant colorist. And I think, I just think we got something very, very unique here. So what we did for the campaign is we've already reached our first four stretch goals. 
and we tried to make them attainable, nothing ridiculous like $80,000, you know. We tried to make them every 1500 bucks, so people felt like we're kind of climbing up a mountain. It's not just some distant goal that can never be reached. We hit all four, and what we do on each stretch goal, and I want to hammer this home. I know you're taking a chance on us, but Steve, myself, and Nelson have done a million books in our years, and some we own, so what we did is collect our our kind of collected library titles that we could choose or we own or had the rights to give out. We're giving out free comic books every stretch goal. The first one's from our animation studios called American Kaiju. It's a fun kaiju story. However, the everyone kind of every stretch goal we kind of up the ante. The second one, you get my out of print uh, podcast art book that's with all the superstars like uh, Pinocchio, Mignola, all that stuff like that. You get an out-of-print sketchbook along with, I can't remember that stretch goal. I want to say that's the one that you get Groom Lake as well. So you get a Temple Smith book, uh, which is pretty cool. Then the next level, we got my out-of-print most popular sketchbook, my cover process sketchbook. So you get that free. And that's 60 pages of high-res art. But on top of that, you get the entire first volume of High Moon, which is an out-of-print DC book by Steve Ellis that was pretty popular get a graphic novel and an out-of-print popular sketchbook. Then we got to the final one, the fourth one. Claire Meath, who was my assistant, who's now our own creator, she's my studio mate, ridiculously popular on IG, an embarrassing amount, like 100,000 people more than I have on uh, Instagram, uh, my, old, my old butt. Regardless, her she does an annual sketchbook. And the first, they're wildly famous. They sell out every time. Uh, the first four volumes that have been out of print for years now are available. Along with that, you get an Ashley Wood comic book called String Divers. That's 13 books you get for any level of backing. You give us one effing dollar at the end of this campaign, you get 13 comic books. And some of them are well-known and by well-known talent, not just myself and Steve. Again, you get Temple Smith, you get uh, Nelson Daniels' book. And now we're trying to figure out the next one. I don't know if I'm going to give away. I got to negotiate some of my more popular titles, but we're going to have another stretch goal at 18K or 50. I forgot what they said. Maybe it's 16. I'm not in charge. I just, I'm, the, I'm the dancing monkey that makes it <laughs> everybody smile the smart people make the rules i just want to stress that we know that you're taking a chance on us and although we've all come with legacies in our career we've all been doing this uh, two three decades and we have our successes i think to lean on none of us are super popular household names because we don't do we haven't spent a lot of time on top tier books when i do spider-man i usually just do one shot or the hulk or venom covers and stuff which doesn't quite build a legacy within those realms you usually have to do things for a little bit for the mainstream to get you know the fans attached to you regardless what i'm saying is take a chance on us i won't i won't steer you wrong look at wild blue yonder my last creator owned book sold out three times every issue and we we were amazon top 10 book we uh eisner nodded i think nelson got that you know we sold it to intel for six figures I, we know what we're doing if people just give us a chance we're willing to reward them with our library so even if our book stinks you got 13 books you got a good chance you got some good reads in there for for whatever you do and that's just the beginning we have we just added merch we've got t-shirts keychains are real popular right now oddly our beer coasters are selling like crazy i guess people we had a beer coaster shortage in america we're, we're trying to make it fun you can buy covers you can buy this is the cheapest possible way that you can buy artwork from steve ellis and i for 200 dollars, you get an original page of inks if you've ever seen my inks uh, they usually go for a lot more than 200 dollars. steve ellis you get a page of pencils so you get two pieces of the same original piece of artwork from pencils to inks from both of us uh that's one way to do it we have sketch covers special covers we did have it went out right away but we we had within three minutes it sold we were a little surprised you can be have a talking part in the book as the speakeasy bartender that sold right away, but we also had like six or eight slots that people could be in the background of the speakeasy, so you can actually be in our comic book, and you get that comic book page that you appear on and things like that. So we're trying to make it fun, fan accessible. I really think we have lightning in the bottle here, so I hope people will at least look at the trailer. I'm sure you've seen the trailer. We put a lot of time into it. It's ridiculous. Uh, we got we hired a good VO actor to play uh, Waylon Jennings as the narrator. So I hope people at least we even have our own hip hop song 
one of my old rapper friends liked it so much he literally just made a, a, an awesome rap song and sent it to us we just posted that online so i'm i'm hoping it becomes a zeitgeist uh, obviously doesn't everybody uh with their their IP. But I think we actually have something. I think this book fills, there's a giant chasm in comic books. It's lacking humor, actual humor, thoughtful humor. It's just, just nothing there. There's no more grooves and things like that that just kind of fill the ambush bug or what was it, Justice League International. Just these ones that stop taking themselves so seriously and just have fun so you can actually detach from reality and just go jump in this ridiculous world just to uh, relax a little bit and uh, uh, have a little enjoyment. I think that's missing for most, especially comic books nowadays. Everything so beats you over the head with with these big, giant issues. And you're like, oh, I just wanted to see Batman punch Killer Croc, you know? And uh, so we're trying to put that in there, our version of Batman kicking uh, Killer Croc in, in the gut or something you know and uh have a little fun and i think we stumbled upon something kind of that's lightning in a bottle and i hope people will give us a chance it sounds like it not, I, I don't think uh it's a chance it to me it sounds like a for sure thing especially you guys you know are backed uh, and you just keep on and hitting these benchmarks and with all those i was like oh my gosh like that's so much stuff that yeah. you know when you invest in one book you don't expect to get Oh, I'm going to get all these other books. I've seen other campaigns and they'll go like, oh, you can get this. You know, it's like essentially it's, it's like you're getting merch is what you're, you're getting for something that you don't even know if you're really into yet. But at the same time, like I've seen the stickers and I've seen the merch and it looks really cool and it looks really fun. And even my wife, she's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, Bigfoot and Sasquatch are the big thing. And I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. But, you know, but people are. I just saw it. My buddy had it on like on his uh, on his Yeti. And I was like, okay, yeah, I guess so. So, yeah. Well, there you go. And then, like you said, just the idea of, you know, your your inspirations and everything around it. You know, I think there's a certain point where, you know, the young generation, they know so little about the past that when you introduce these things that's so new to them, that that's what it is, right? Like, to yeah. you, it's not new. It's It's what you grew up with. But they don't have that stuff on TV anymore for whatever reason. And yeah. that's your influence. And so you putting into that, it's completely fresh and new, or maybe you just find the right crowd. So that's, there's so many different angles to hit there where, like I said, new people that, that don't know of this. And then people that go, oh, I know this influence and I want more of that because I miss it because it doesn't exist anymore. Outstanding I to hear that, uh, dude, because uh, that's exactly what we're going for. When, we, when I was a guest, I was fortunate enough to be a guest at C2E2 this year signing for Hellboy. And we did our launch at the show. And one thing I noticed two things is kids liked it for whatever reason, walking by every single kid stopped, every single kid stopped, not necessarily for kids. We're not making it. I mean, there's no like gratuitous nudity or anything like that. So kids could read it technically. One thing I noticed Gen Xers, it is like ambrosia to Gen Xers, man. I don't think I saw one person my age or older that didn't stop and want to talk and find out about it. And it was a really good kind of metric for us to understand, okay, we, we do have something here. We ran out of stickers immediately. We ran out of flyers immediately. We had to make coasters for the giveaway because we've ran out of everything. At C2E2, we did free, uh, Steve and I would do a free uh, three by five commission of your choice on a little uh, Moonshine Bigfoot uh, promotional card, those sold out. I think I did 50-something of them, like uh, literal commissions at C2E2 till my old man hand was shaking. And there's something going on, and I, that's why I, I guess I'm going full bore in, into social and meeting people like you, which I'm usually pretty good at being a recluse, but I'm, I am very proud of this. To your point, you get a goodie bag just a, a little Pandora's box of books uh, just for taking it the smallest chance. You could buy the digital book. You could buy, but we also have signed books. Uh, this is going to be the only time I, I can only, I was in Chile once and that's the only time that Nelson Daniel and I ever signed a comic book together. And we have several big properties together from the Cape with Joe Hill to Wild Blue Yonder so this is the only time we're going to be able to get signed books by like the whole Steve Ellis, myself, uh, Nelson Daniel, Clara Meath. I mean, uh, our, our writer, Mike 
Marlowe, who's an actor slash playwright. Uh, this is his first comic, actually. That's why I'm co-writing. Uh, not that I'm a writer, but uh, I just got to be there because we're he's used to writing screenplays. But he's he's also a comic book dork, so it's working pretty well. I, I, I was a little worried at first, but uh, what am I going to get? But uh, Mike is just outperformed at every step of the way. Being a stage actor, I think he has a really good sense of timing as far as like when to make the crowd laugh and things like that. And he's doing a good job of translating that to scripting. And all Steve and I do then is kind of make it work within comic books. So it's a really neat kind of synergistic relationship between three storytellers. Uh, whereas a lot of books, as many people know, most probably don't. Like when I'm working on Batman, it's like a, uh, or at least back in the day when I worked on Batman, it was kind of like a factory line. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's commercial art, the protector of the brand, and then some good stories come out of that. However, me personally, I, I couldn't find any joy in that. You know, once I got to the top of the mountain, I'm drawing Batman, that, that shine wore off real quick when I realized in factory, kind of like the putting a spindle in the box factory floor uh, uh, conveyor belt line of making comic books, you, you kind of lose the soul of what you're doing, if that makes sense. Mm. You, you kind of, it just becomes a job at that point. And that's what it felt like. And that's what it felt like with some of the people I was working with. It just didn't, I didn't see a lot of passion in it. They're just like, let's go make another Spider-Man or whatever book and hammer that paycheck. And and I'm not trying to disparage anyone. And there's room for all of us in all types of books. I just found that that type of setting I did not excel in. I was just miserable all the time, uh, no matter what I was working on. I want to see people come over to the indie side and see, I think we're creating things that will curl your toes, man. As you say, we're bringing everything we can to the artwork and when i say everything we can we are really trying to make this a masterpiece which you don't really see in comedy very often you see that in whatever book an alan moore book or a rick remender book you know high tier books is usually where you get the high tier art i.e batman we think we can kick batman's ass while telling a goofy fun story so i think there's again a unique spot for us uh and a hole that we're filling rather than uh, strip strip level artwork for comedy where it's never really endearing you're just kind of getting the point across if that makes sense absolutely and i think that this is the perfect time because i've seen that shift where within myself and people that i know other comic book people that i you know that are into comics where we were starting in mainstream and we saw over time of it going they're they're just doing this event thing over and over and over. Yeah. They're, they're just trying to milk us for cash. They don't even care about story anymore. They don't care about the characters. They don't care about you know so 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 little do they care about the arc and everything yeah. like that and the growth and everything like that. And and so you go well, let's try something different. Let's try this indie stuff to the point where you're getting more indie than you are anything else because you're finding more satisfaction in that. And then even more so, you go, okay, well, this this indie stuff's good. And then it just even goes further with, like, Kickstarter. And then it starts with Kickstarter, and then they get picked up by other stuff, you know? A lot of people are doing this self-publishing thing, and then it get picks, gets picked up by somebody else because it already has such a great following. Following, yeah. Go, hey, this is a sure thing. We already know this at this point. Again, it's, it's the perfect time for this. Honored, man. And I, I think so, too. We're in a... I think comics is obviously in a major evolution right now. Uh, print media is going away. Digital media hasn't quite found its avenue of dissemination yet. You know, it, I, there's going to be something that where we go, comic books will be around. My gosh, the medium sequential art was around before probably dynamic language was. That's why cave paintings on walls were comic books, you know, <laughs> and when the aliens come and sip through the ashes of humanity, they're going to find pictorials that help them understand what we are. So there's always going to be sequential art. What form it takes, unfortunately, it looks like print media is kind of becoming a niche, but it's not there yet. I still, I'm old. I like books in my hands, that tactile feeling, but it has, there's nothing wrong with a digital comic book. I've read phenomenal ones and there's things you can do with it that you can't do in a comic book. You can do spot animation. You can do sound. When I did uh, the, when I it was showrunner and commons book with robert glasper for webtoons we did both animation and an original score by robert glasper 
uh, that cued as he went through panels, it, it would change music and tones and things. So who knows where comic books are going? But right now, what, what excites me is that, and again, th there's nothing wrong with mainstream comic books, but to your point, I always felt like they're keepers of the brand. You're not really going to do anything profound with the character, it, albeit accidental. Um, occasionally things, nuggets shake out and they're, they are profound, but it's usually Batman's on kids' underwear. You know, so are the X-Men. You're not going to be changing that character. They're making, right. uh, that's their, their bread and butter moneymaker. When I was drawing Batman, my only joy was, there I go, my name's on a Batman book with the, the other 10,000 people that have done Batman. But when I did Wild Blue Yonder, only my name is on there, along with uh, my fellow creators, forever, ever. I even sold it. I don't own it anymore. It was so successful, I just ended up selling it. And, you know, it, it helped my wife and I out a lot. Uh, sad when you have to sell your baby. It was the situation was right. Um, and there's the upside of indie, too. If you create something successful, people think you can't make money. I've been in the almost my entire career and I've paid my mortgage, helped pay for my wife's clinic when we bought it. Uh, now we own our own hospital and things like that. So it doesn't make you rich, but you can pay the bills doing it. To your point that where the true creativity, what the mainstream rips off anyways, is always developed. The alchemy happens in indie, indie comics. All the major advances in far, as far as the field artistically, storytelling wise, format everything always happens in indie and then those those more successful things that come out of it then are adapted by the big companies look don't abandon you don't have to abandon batman or spider-man sorry i'm picking on batman it's just the one <laughs> that is coming up but and there's nothing wrong with batman nor the people that do it it's just not for me i think you it's like the difference between a fast feel a fast food meal and a michelin rated chef cooking you a meal you, there's no chance of getting a Michelin rated chef when you go through the McDonald's drive through And that's what I kind of see most comic books as. They're just fast food. They're kind of empty calories. As opposed to if you really put your time into... For my thought, I was just trying to express, I used a food analogy. Most comic books are, I consider them fast food. They're Arby's and McDonald's meals. Technically nothing wrong with them, but they're not, you're not getting any nutrition out of them. There's just kind of an over flavor that you get and you're done. And then you can just kind of get, you know, soft and, and gooey and, and uh, uh, lethargical about them or from that meal. Whereas if you get a restaurant meal, say a Michelin chef of someone that put an extreme amount of planning into this, you're going to have an enjoyable event that gives you a ton of nutrition. It stays with you as a memory, and, and it, you can enjoy it with other friends. I, I'd like to see more fans, and I think it's starting to happen to your point, where they do both. You can go get your McDonald's chicken nuggets, but come back and have an epic meal with uh, Michelin chefs that truly care about about every aspect of the meal and the experience that you're getting, rather than hammering the check, there's your monthly Batman, uh, enjoy. And then you forget. Can you remember all 1,500,000 episodes of Batman? No, because they're fast food burgers. But you can certainly remember Watchmen with Alan Moore, a Michelin chef meal. I think there's room for both, but I just wish people took more chances on uh, creators uh, to make that substantial meal for them, to, to complete my stupid analogy. And I think we have something here with that. And that's what I try to do for all my create our own books. That's what I was even trying to do when I was doing Hellboy with Mignola. I'm trying to give you an experience that you don't see anywhere else. I know it's goofy. Please embrace the goofy with me. And I promise you, we're going to take you on an adventure with Moonshine Bigfoot and help us get off the ground floor. One thing I realized, not a lot of people understand. Okay, we signed with Image. Image doesn't pay me a dime. You know, we have to build this damn book. So a little bit of support from you guys uh, gets us so we aren't drawing uh, backup Aquaman annuals in between our own book to try and pay our mortgage, which it, it's a lot better for a creator if we can just do one thing. That's why I ask people to come support us. We get the 13 free books and they're not garbage. We got some gems in there, absolute gems for everybody. Big, substantial free books for any level of signing up. I know I'm repetitive, everyone. A lot of fun merch, a lot of fun. You, there's something for everybody in there, I believe. And I hope they at least watch that darn trailer because holy cow, I, I'm not, I haven't been that proud about something in a very long time. And that's what I would say.
Come join us mid on this little adventure, and I promise you, I promise you, we're not going to let you down. We're going to deliver uh, just an unbelievable home run for you. Yeah, I think you got like some uh, Texas Roadhouse prime rib, or uh, you know, some some <laughs> some grade A choice sirloin there. There yeah, we go, good. sir. You know, there so, we go. So, Thanks. I, for I, I suggest people do it for sure. I'm going to without a doubt. Oh, I appreciate it, man. And like I said, it doesn't have to be much, and you get every single thing in setup that we got. At least check it out for us. We got art that'll curl your toes off your feet and uh, a story like one you haven't ever seen. So uh, where can we get it, and where can we check you out? So first, Moonshine Bigfoot. It's on Kickstarter live right now. It's uh, Kickstarter gave it the projects we love. They've been promoting it for us, so they got behind it. Really easy to find on Kickstarter. If you need a direct link, www.inked.pub slash Moonshine Bigfoot. That's the quick link to it. Any of my social obviously has links and trailers and stuff like that. You can find me on any of these fine things. Uh, IG, space friend underscore Z, uh, uh, Facebook. You can just type my name in. That's where I'm most popular uh, on Facebook. Um, I have Instagram. I have a website, just ZachHoward.com. Instagram uh, has a lot of our stuff. Claire's most active on there, along with Steve Ellis. They're both way more popular on me uh, than on uh, Instagram. I have the most presence on Facebook. If you want to find me, you can as, as gross as it sounds, you can Google me or just search on any platform. I usually pop up pretty quick. I'm, there's not a lot of Zach Howards out there, especially uh, that draw comic books. Pretty easy to find. At worst, just watch that darn trailer, everyone. I think I think uh, it has something for you. To your point, I thought it was really beautiful what you said. Yeah, we're we're crack cocaine for Gen Xers. This is woo. They're all excited because of that nostalgia, kind of the innocence of of pop culture back then. Whether justified or not, it was just felt innocent back then. Versus new people, like I say. A lot of young dudes just are attracted to it because it's still hot rods and Bigfoot doing jumps and over cops and stuff. So it has that kind of fun outlaw muscle car feeling the spirit that I think a lot of young men and kids are attracted to. Uh, we think we got something for everybody. Some adult overtones, just goofy action and humor. But it all ties together in a beautiful story about a coming of age. It happens to be a Bigfoot, but it is a coming of age age story of a young man we're pretty happy with it dude awesome looking forward to it and everyone else should too check him out check moonshine bigfoot at kickstarter and us all at tntm the show facebook twitter instagram tumblr youtube gmail hotmail all of it everywhere talk nerdy to me i'm gonna talk nerdy to you thanks for having me sir